Very good morning to one and all. I bring greetings also from the pastors, leaders, and members of Zion Bishan. And I must say, I really enjoy coming here for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is uh, it made me feel younger. <laughs> Ah, I don't know the reason. The reason is because it reminds me about you know, in the early 90s. I probably have served here uh, much earlier than you all. <laughs> in the early 90s, I was involved with the gospel mission to the blind on the second floor. I was a volunteer there and we had such a fun time ministering to the folks who are visually challenged and to see how they praise God. Although they can't see, they memorize the song. They don't need they don't need any PowerPoint. They memorize the song and they sang it so heartily, just like you all do. Second reason why I feel uh, quite joyful to be here is I got this, I get this family feel here you know, uh, whenever I come. Uh, maybe because uh, to me, family is very important. Perhaps uh, that's why when I was uh, kind of preparing this sermon today, uh, it reminded me of my dear mother uh, whom God had caught home just uh, last year last instead of February to be exact <laughs> you know but uh, back in 2019 just the beginning of this uh, uh, COVID at the end of 2019 my mom was also found to have dementia so started deteriorating in 2019 uh, remember 2020 uh, 7th of April was the start of the lockdown so far away, I forgot already. Eh? <laughs> yeah. So remember that we were not even able to, not allowed to visit our parents. Uh, uh. And I was so, so concerned and so afraid that the isolation uh, will make her dementia worse. And we were praying that, you know, uh, that one, maybe one day when we are able to visit her, that she would still be able to recognize us. And finally, we were able to, when uh, things were get, getting better, and uh, we were able to visit her, and we brought food to her place because uh, eating out was still limited. And then my heart broke because when my wife asked my mom before we eat, uh, before we ate, my mom, uh, my wife said, "Mom, can you pray and give thanks for the food?" And my mom looked at my wife blankly and said, "Sorry." I have forgotten how to pray. I'm quite sure it was because of the dementia. But it got me thinking. Dementia aside, can a healthy, able-bodied Christian forget how to pray? And I believe we all know that the effects of the pandemic on Christians prove that it can. Able-bodied, healthy Christians can forget how to pray. And not only can we forget how to pray, we can even forget to pray. Or forget about church. Or even forget about being a Christian. The pandemic proved that. To be exact, worldwide spiritual attrition rate is about 30% because of the pandemic. 30% dropped out of church. 30% didn't return to the church after the pandemic. And these include both young and old Christians who have been to church for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And so I understand that, Harold, this season, you are focusing on discipleship. So today, I would like to share with you on spiritual growth. What is spiritual growth? Maybe let's go on and pray. Father, we come to your word. We look to you for your grace that, God, you will open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear you, our minds that we may understand, Lord, your will, and most importantly, your will. Above all, open our hearts that we may receive from you and you only, in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is spiritual growth? 
Is it about doing more quiet time, reading more Bible, doing more good works, coming regularly to church, maybe offering, serve here and there, etc., etc.? What do you think? And I love this little story that there was a man uh, who bought a house that was heavily discounted. Not the, San, not the Sentosa Cove one. Uh. Andrew, no, right? <laughs> heavily discounted, 40%. Right? Uh, that house was heavily discounted because right in front of the house has got this huge rock mm, in front of the front yard. Uh, so the man said, never mind, la, discounted, discounted, uh, discounted, uh, rock, rock, la, so I'll buy it. La. But very soon he found the rock, big rock, right in front, blocking his house entrance and every, his view and everything. He found it very eyesore. So he started to work at it with a hammer and chisel, and he chipped away <clears throat> at the huge boulder. And very soon it became a beautiful stone elephant. <clears throat> and when he finished, it became this. And so the neighbor was very curious and said, Hey, how did you ever turn a stone into an elephant? And the man replied, I just chipped away everything that didn't look like an elephant. What is spiritual growth? It is to grow more and more in Christ's likeness. What do we see of Christ in the Gospels and as we have sung, consider Christ. What do we like about Christ in the Gospels and that will be our blueprint. And then we start to slowly chip away anything in our lives that does not look like Christ. And I believe slowly and surely the life springs, the way we talk, the way we live, the values we hold will get more and more like Christ. We can see in today's passage three areas that Paul will want us to work on that we may be more and more like Christ. The mark of a growing Christian is seen in how much a Christian loves, in how much a Christian perseveres, and in how much a Christian grows. Let's take a look at the first one. It says, The mark of a growing Christian is seen in how much a Christian loves. Verses 1 to 3. Now we should know that Paul may have spent only about three weeks or at most three months in Thessalonica. And he was forced to leave this new church, this infant church that he planted. I mean, we all know, right? Uh, whether Christians, the uh, three week or three month old or even three years old, we would consider that that's still very, very short. Young Christians, we say. Right? Some churches, young Christians are not allowed to serve. Mm. But don't you think that it was a miracle that the Christians in Thessalonica not only did their faith not die out after Paul left, but thrived to form the first church of Thessalonica. In modern church terminology, I believe we would all agree that all these are very spiritually young Christians. Agree? But you know what? From what we read in verse 3, I don't think the words spiritually young have ever crossed Paul's mind. Now, why do I say that? Take a look again in verse 3. Paul told the what we call spiritually very young Christians, he told them, he said, we ought always to give thanks for you. <coughs> now, pay attention to the word ought. Paul was not saying we want to thank God for you. He said, we ought to. Now, the original language meaning is, we are bound to, we are duty bound to thank God for you. Or we are indebted to you, we owe it to you to thank God for you. 
Now, please don't forget the word always. <coughs> always. <coughs> we ought always to thank God for you. Don't you think that's a very, very high compliment to this so-called young Christians? No. What do you think made Paul compliment them in this remarkable way? He gave us the reason. Because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Now when we read Paul carefully, he tend to put words, the words faith and love together whenever he talk about Christian wellness or Christian spirituality. So to Paul, spiritual maturity is not about how long we have been a Christian, but how much we trust in God as shown, as shown in our living out a life of love and sacrifice. Now, maybe let's do an exercise. It's a quick application here. Right. We know a lot of people in the church, right? In all of you in the church. Now think about someone you know, okay? But maybe not husband and wife, lah, huh? friends, lah. Huh? Think about someone you know, and then ask yourself, when do you know this person, and how long have you known that person? Got it, yeah? Okay, here's the exercise. Ask yourself, have my love for that person increased since the first time we became friends? What would be your answer? I think we can all learn much about friends and love from porcupines. Their spikes will stick out when they are responding to aggression. And then it will come back nicely when they feel safe. Well, they can't be together when their spikes are sticking out, right? In fact, the more they stick out, the more they prick each other, the more their spikes will have to stick out. In fact, my, when I got married in 2002, uh, my wedding speaker actually used the porcupine analogy to remind me of this, and my wife then for this. He said the key to friendship and love is to be less affected and more affectionate. The mark of a growing Christian is seen in how much a Christian loves. And secondly, is seen in how much a Christian perceives. Now verse 4 says, and here's another high compliment. It said, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions <coughs> and in the affliction, afflictions that you are enduring. So we are reminded that faith and love always come with a price. And Paul seems to hint that at least some of their persecutions and trials were the results of their love. I mean, well, isn't it true that the people who love us the most sometimes are the people we hurt the most. Isn't it true? Familiarity breeds contempt. People who love us usually are very nice. So nice that we not only take them for granted, but also think that they can be bullied. That's our human weakness and fallenness. That's reality. That's why it hurts to love. It hurts to love. But we don't give up. <clears throat> this little story about a daughter complained to her father about how hard things were for her. She said, as soon as I solve one problem, another problem comes up and I'm tired of struggling. And so her father took her to the kitchen, filled three pots with water and then turned on the fire. In one, he placed a carrot. In the second one, an egg. In the last, ground coffee powder. 
and he let them sit and boil without saying a word. And then after that, he took out the carrots, the eggs, and poured the coffee into a cup. He asked her to feel the carrots, and she said they were soft. He asked her to break an egg, and it was a hard boiled egg. And finally, he asked her to sip the coffee, and she smiled as it ta she tasted the rich flavor. She knew what her father was trying to tell her. The carrot, egg, and coffee powder all faced the same adversity of boiling water. The carrot went in strong, hard, and unrelenting, but after being subjected to the boiling water, it softened and became weak. The egg has only a fragile outer look, and after sitting through the boiling water, its inside hardened. But the ground coffee powder, by giving itself up, changed the water into aromatic coffee. When adversity knocks on your door, which are you? Verse 5 tells us that how we respond to adversity as a Christian is important. Now, a casual reading of verse 5 can be a little confusing. <coughs> so when Paul says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, was he saying that God uses the persecution and trials to judge them? Cannot be, right? Because we just read that Paul was praising them like crazy. Hmm? I mean, when my children fall down, they didn't cry, they pick themselves up and they say, well done, son, or well done, daughter, but I wouldn't in the next breath say, serve you right. Correct? So what was Paul saying? That this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Allow me to paraphrase. I believe Paul was saying how you respond to the persecution and trials is evidence that God's choice of you is correct. And that was exactly why Paul continued. He said that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. So in short, Paul was saying, well done, you have passed the quality control test. Hmm. How we respond to adversity is a testimony to not just that God has made the right choice in choosing us, how we respond to adversity is also evidence that we belong to God. Now, Paul was not saying that we allow ourselves to be climbed and walked over like a floor mat. No, no. But Paul was challenging us to respond, especially when adversity knocks on our door, that we will respond in a godly manner, whether it is like natural illnesses or man-caused pains and disappointments whatever they are sometimes we spend too much time trying to analyze what are god sent trials what are devil inspired temptations it's a royal waste of time because whether it is trials or whether it is temptations what do you think we have to overcome them and overcome them in a godly manner <coughs> <clears throat> because as we do that, then we can say God is for us and it is only then that verses 6 to 10 would have any meaning, significance and more importantly, relevance to us. And this leads us nicely to our final thought for today on what does it mean to grow spiritually? Because the mark of a growing Christian is seen in how much we love we persevere and we grow. Another story. Abraham Lincoln. 
he was said to have once tested a few candidates for promotion. So before he announced who he's going to promote, so he tested them with this question, asking them. He said, how many legs does a dog have if I insisted on calling the tail a leg? Remember, your president asked you. How many legs does a dog have if I, the president, insist on calling the tail a leg? What do you think would be your answer? Five, eh? <laughs> Or, except one agreed that it is five. But only one said to Abraham Lincoln, Sir, calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. That man was promoted. <laughs> Being a Christian for 10 years does not necessarily mean one has grown spiritually for 10 years. We can go to church each Sunday, give our offering, tithe, pledge, we serve. Those are good and are what Christian must be engaged in. But does that mean we would have grown? Christian activities are only a small part of our spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is more about who we are than what we do. Now let me ask you, how would you determine if a person is mature or not? You wouldn't say that this one 70 year old mature, this one 20 year old is immature, right? Now let me ask you, would you agree that the best, person, best way to see if a person is mature or not is to see how the person handles differences and especially conflicts? Because adversities brings out the best or the worst in us. Some years back, I brought my daughter to a toy section in Bugis Junction. Two couples were fighting, quarreling over who gets to push their strollers through those narrow shopping lanes, uh, department store lanes, uh, very small, narrow. You know what happened? It ended up with the two men fighting and the woman was screaming at each other. I quickly carried my daughter, that time she was still a baby, uh, to the lift, one, you know, Bugis, there's one lift in the center there. So I quickly ran inside, I want to go down. And then, you know what happened? They fought into the lift. <laughs> <laughs> I got to cover her eyes, her ears, and everything. I used my body to shield her. And you know what? That day was Mother's Day. I brought my daughter to buy a present for my wife, plan planning to buy a present for my wife. That was Mother's Day. And I saw that two couples, their children, they were crying, they were tugging at their parents. No, no, no. Adversities bring out the best or the worst in us, especially during conflicts. James summed it up well. He said, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. I mean, we all know in the Gospels that Peter was the most impetuous, the most among the disciples, right? Uh, <clears throat> Perhaps that was why Peter himself wrote, For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. Today is Holy Communion, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in His footsteps. Consider Christ, we sang. So what do you think the words that you might follow in his footsteps mean? Does it mean that I'm a Christian so I must do it? 
Or does it mean that I'm a Christian so I will do it? I think Paul would say, I'm a Christian. I can do it by His grace. So as we read in verse 11, Paul was convinced that those called by God are also enabled to fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by His power. Paul is saying that it is not just probable or possible, but definite that Christians, every single one of us, we can overcome whatever adversities that might come our way by the power of God in us, the Spirit of the risen Christ. Do you believe that? Look at the word name, the name in verse 12. I mean, for us, a name is just a name, right? Uh, we name our children, our parents name us. Name is just a name. Uh, <clears throat> but in biblical times, a name really refers to the whole person. So when Paul says the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, he was in fact saying the whole person of the Lord Jesus Christ who is glorified is now dwelling in you. And don't forget about the little phrase there, and you in him. It is not just that Christ lives within us, but also we becoming a part of Christ. So we are not just following Christ's footsteps. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> like where he goes, we follow. It's more than that. We are also walking in Christ's footsteps, foot for foot. Mm. So back to our thesis question again. What does it mean to grow spiritually? <clears throat> I believe I've shared this in the camp, if my memory serves me well. Two years ago, yeah? Two years ago. Last year only, yeah? Okay, lao liao. I once uh, visited a uh, very ill elderly lady. Uh, so I was delayed, so uh, I went there quite late. Uh, that was before COVID. Uh, so visitation hours is okay. So when I reached there, she was uh, kind of asleep. So I just sat there a while, thought that I would just pray for her and then I would quietly leave. Then when I was done, I said I was going to leave. Then suddenly she opened her eyes to stare at me and then she smiled and said, oh, Pastor LB. Mm. Uh, and then after that, I just asked her, why are you smiling? Yeah, so happy to see me, huh? She said, actually, no. <laughs> she said, for a moment when I opened my eyes, I thought you are Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so I smiled. Uh, so we chatted a bit and then I left. And before I left, I thought I want to pull a prank on her. I said, hey, uh, tonight when you sleep and when the Lord Jesus come, really come and bring you home, uh, when you see Jesus, can you do me a favor and tell him something? She said, what is it? I said, when you see Jesus, you smile at him and say, for the moment, I thought you are Pastor LB. <laughs> she died two hours later. <clears throat> what does it mean to grow spiritually? It means to think, to act, to talk like Jesus so much that we become Jesus to our family, to our friends, 
to the world out there. I like this beautiful Sunday school song. Little by little in every day. Have you sung that before? Uh, here, right? Long time ago. Uh. Not me. Lah. I sang. Uh, yeah. I love this. Little by little in every way, Jesus is changing me. Would you allow this same Jesus that is in you? Little by little to chip away anything that doesn't look like Jesus. And I trust and I believe soon, soon, when people see you, they see Jesus. Shall we look to him in prayer? Before I close, I'd like to invite you to respond in your own way and in your own words before I close. God, you heard the prayer of your people and we trust that in your good time you will make their lives beautiful. You will make all things beautiful because in your good time you will make them and you will make all of us more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, whose name we pray. Amen.